Uh, so with that, why don't we get started? Um, the, the store, there, there's just no shortage to, to talk, the things to talk about with, with uh, Novacure right now. Uh, but why don't we get started with the update just from last week, last patient being enrolled uh, in the phase three lunar trial. Uh, this does now start the clock on that 12 month uh, patient follow up period, uh, as you indicated in last week's release. But you know, let's play it forward now 12 months. You know, what will investors see when we get to that 12 month period? Uh, will, will we get both primary and secondary endpoints by the end of next year? And then how soon will we get full results from that trial? Sure. So uh, thanks, Jason, and thanks everyone for joining the chat today. Um, as, as you mentioned, we had two uh, very uh, important milestones in our clinical program. Um, the first we actually announced was the last patient in, in our Innovate trial in ovarian cancer, although the, the follow-up there's 18 months, so those data will be uh, available a little later. And then uh, the last patient in, in our lunar uh, trial in, in second line non small cell lung cancer that because of the 12 month follow up uh, those data will be uh, will be available earlier so the the follow up period is the time from the last patient in uh, to the end of the trial um, and as we approach uh, the the end of the trial we begin to do uh, data cleaning um, so it, this is not these large complex uh, oncology trials. It's not as if a, the date is on the uh, the 30th and then on the first, all of a sudden the data uh, are available. There is a period of time of uh, of, of cleaning and uh, and sorting uh, the data. This is true for Novacure. It's true for Merck. It's true for all of the uh, the trials. And then we actually start to see what uh, the report is. Our um, expectation is that we will press release what we call the top line data, uh, which basically gives everybody an indication of uh, uh, whether the trial has been successful uh, or not. Um, and then the full data set is typically uh, presented in the first opportunity of a, of a large medical conference. Um, again, this is the tradition in, uh, uh, in our industry to uh, enable the, the full data set to be presented at a at an ASCO or, or you know, some uh, conference uh, like that for the, the medical community to, to see it. So it's a combination of a, of a top line press release and then a full uh, disclosure and discussion of the data at the first available medical conference. Okay, so just to put a finer point on that, does that, does that, that top line press release, would that include primary and secondary endpoints or will it just be primary endpoint they'll be reporting on? And then just for, to baseline everyone, so expectations don't get out of whack, well, that, that, that those full results, is it probably best to calibrate that we should be expecting those early 2023 then, not you know late 2022? You know, I think it's probably a little early for me to answer any of those questions. Our goal is to get, certainly let the market know as soon as possible. So as soon as we know, we don't like to be in the situation where there's data in the company uh, and you know risk of, uh, of, of you know, disclosure in a way that we don't want to. So our, our goal is, as soon as we know, to get the uh, the, the data that's important to the market uh, out via press release, uh, and then the data that's important to the to the clinical community out as soon as possible in a medical conference. But it really is a two part uh, process. But we want we want to get everything that's important uh, to the market out to the market without jeopardizing a very high profile uh, presentation at a medical conference. Got it. Okay. Uh, fair enough. And then for for this new and potential new indication, you know, this is probably new for a lot of investors in the stock today. Um, maybe help with what this process looks like. You know, after we close up the the, the last patient follow up in, in November of 22. You know, what happens when it comes to the regulatory submission process? Assuming the data looks good as you expect it will, um, is there anything you can do in advance of having that data in hand to prepare for that regulatory submission process? Yeah. So there's a lot, uh, and in fact, we're doing it already. So first of all, what's the process? So we we do the same. Uh, data uh, cleaning, and in fact, the data cleaning is really for the regulatory process. You know, the, the secondary uh, uh, byproduct is the press release that I described, uh, presentation at a medical conference, and then ultimately publication in a peer review uh, 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 journal. But the real process is to get the data ready for the FDA and the other international uh, regulators. Uh, that is, I'll, I'll focus on the FDA, uh, but the process is similar in the other uh, geographies. We then submit, uh, we are governed by the PMA, Process at the FDA. Uh, this is for those, you know, medtech folks. Is the more rigorous of the uh, of the medical device pathways, um, and then the FDA has uh, 180 days uh, to work on and review uh, the data. Now, what can we do ahead of time? That that process will include uh, site uh, uh, inspections uh, and uh, and visits. Those are random, uh, you know, so they don't go to every site, every center, but they'll go to uh, um, many of them. Uh, and it's usually the sites that have the highest volume of patients. Um, so we begin to work with those sites to prepare them for their uh, FDA audits. Uh, the submission also has a, a number of modules. Um, the, the module that we're talking about now is the clinical module, uh, but the, there's also a uh, a device module uh, that's based on the on the design of the device. This device will be very similar to our mesothelioma uh, product that's already approved. So that that module, that part of the submission, um, 
you know, it's, quite frankly, it's already in very good shape, but it will be uh, any, any you know, modifications to that part of the submission that are specific to non-small cell lung cancer are already being worked on. Um, so it's so we get everything ready, we get the sites ready, and then we pull together the clinical module as soon as the data are uh, are, are available. All right. Excellent. That's, that's helpful. Um, why don't we talk about another recent study we had some data on, and it's one that I've actually characterized as being one of the more underappreciated trials out there using your technology. That's the, the to the top stu- phase two study out of the University of Florida. Uh, progression-free survival extension there looked really impressive uh, in that patient population when pairing Detruda with Optune. Uh, maybe talk, Bill, about how you plan to use that to the top data. I think in the past you've alluded to moving forward with an, a formal phase three trial. Where are you at in that, in that planning process or evaluating that planning process? And do you need to wait for to the top to actually be done be, and fully complete with all, all patients? And follow up before you move forward with something on your own. Yeah. So, um, so thanks for asking that. I, in, in many respects, I think these are some of the most important results that uh, um, that we've presented. So, so why do I say that? So, first of all, for everyone, to the top is an open label phase two study uh, that was conducted by Dr. David Tran at the University of uh, Florida. David leads the, uh, the the brain cancer uh, clinical and research activity. At- uh, university. Um, the, this is a so-called investigator-sponsored trial, so it's not a Novacure-sponsored trial. This was a uh, an idea of David's that he submitted to the company, and uh, and we agreed to fund. Um, and it was based on preclinical research that he and others performed that showed that uh, while there there are many tumor types, and and uh, Keytruda has been tried in large studies uh, to uh, with GBM and has shown no benefit. Uh, Nevo, you know, Bristol's uh, product has also been tried and has shown no benefit. But what David saw when he combined. Uh, well, he added Keytruda after starting treating with tumor treating fields, was that tumor treating fields activated the immune system to make it susceptible, if you will, to the uh, effects of Keytruda. You know, to put it really uh, simply, took a cold tumor and turned it hot uh, to uh, immunotherapy. <clears throat> so, uh, so he then moved uh, into uh, a phase two trial. And importantly, many phase two trials have, in GB- GBM specifically, have, I-, I would say, given a false positive. What do I mean by that? The last 35 or so drug trials uh, in GBM have all, phase three trials have all failed. Many of them have happened after a phase two trial showed promising results. Why is that the case and this different? It's been the case because the, the prognostic factors of many of those other trials of the patients have been very good. The patients have been young, they've been healthy, they've had uh, uh, their methylation status, their MGMT status has been positive, which means then that their uh, uh, expectancy, their life expectancy is longer. And then those trials were compared to the old Roger Stoop, original New England Journal of Medicine uh, standard of care. And they said, gee, these patients did better than, than, the, than the, the, the Stoop protocol in the New England Journal of Medicine 15 years ago, must be promising. Why is this different? This is different because the prognostic factors of the patients that Tran recruited were among the worst. So 72% of these patients were MGMT negative. These are the patients for whom uh, uh, timazolamide, TMZ, has no benefit. Many of the patients were biopsy only, meaning that they had multifocal tumors that were not amenable uh, to surgery. Um, and he compared his uh, patients, not to the old Stoop paper, but to our EF14 active group. So. The, the best phase three data to date, which is our much more recent EF14 data compared to uh, to the top. And in that comparison, uh, the progression-free survival so far, and you know, he's, he's, he only had a uh, 12-month follow-up on, I forget the percentage, but uh, uh, about two-thirds of the patients, um, <clears throat> is already uh, double the uh, uh, progression-free survival that we saw in EF14. And he has a significant number, about 25% have uh, responses in a disease where there are very few responses. So. Um, so very promising, very, very promising. Uh, we are now in the planning stages for a registration trial combining these two therapies. And these are the data that underpinned our partnership with Merck in non-small cell lung cancer. So under NDA, prior to this disclosure uh, last weekend, Merck had seen the data, had analyzed the data, uh, and determined to go forward with a program in their uh, key indication, right? Uh, first line non-small cell lung cancer. And they're also the data that now underpin our partnership with Genentech uh, in metastatic uh, pancreatic cancer. So it, it's, it's potentially great for GBM patients, but it's, but it's much more. Um, it's much more. It has the potential to, to activate uh, a whole classes of um, uh, uh, otherwise inactive solid tumors uh, to Keytruda and Nevo and the other uh, anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1 uh, immunotherapies. All right, that's extremely helpful. And if, if I could just follow up on, on one point there, just on, um, we always love on our side, just timing and things that are definitive. And I know that's really tough in, in, kind of in, in the, the process that you're running. And I, don't, I know you don't want to commit to anything necessarily, but if you're in the planning phases right now, does that mean planning as in like, this is something, something within the next three years? Or, or can we actually reasonably think about something where we see protocols and patient enrollment in the next 12 months on this trial? Uh, it's 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 the latter. Okay. All right. Great. That's very I think helpful. We want to move this forward. These data are great. We've we've had early again because it's been open label. Um, you know, it was a 
uh, you know, the first time the community saw the totality of the data, but we've been aware of these data for uh, for some time, and uh, and the planning uh, has been ongoing for some time. Excellent. I, I did have a question come in from the investor group, somewhat related to this. You, you touched, Bill, on, on Tino V36, the other the, the trial right now, the other trial really that's sponsored by Novacure in combination or in cooperation or collaboration with Merck uh, for Keytruda plus TT Fields for first line uh, therapy in stage three non small cell lung cancer. And with the question being, what's, what, what's been holding up enrollment on that trial? Um, it does feel like you know we've been waiting for that first patient to come in. I think you have five centers that have been uh, you know have gone through the process and been approved to, re to recruit. They're actively out there trying to recruit. So what's holding up that patient enrollment? Yeah, so let me let me answer this. I'll answer it directly, but I'm going to remind everyone that Lunar, our phase three trial in uh, second line on small cell lung cancer, one of the two arms is tumor treating fields plus immunotherapy. We, we didn't specify Keytruda or Nevo. It's physician's choice compared to tumor treating fields plus uh, paclitaxel uh, compared to uh, a control uh, group. So um, now that that trial has completed enrollment within 12 months, you know, back to our original conversation, we're going to be seeing data uh, in lung cancer. Now, on to uh, uh, Keynote P36. Uh, patients are being screened for that trial. Uh, you know, we're, we're in the any day now mode uh, to announce first patient in. Um, I think it's just the, you know, our focus, I will tell you within the company, had been to get uh, lunar complete. Um, and so that's where our, you know, site energy uh, had been, is to really, uh, to get lunar done. Uh, and now that energy can uh, uh, can be directed to uh, Keynote P36. Sure. Fair helpful. That makes a ton of sense. Um, maybe you know, bigger picture. We've touched on you know, some of the other immunotherapy uh, you know, combination studies that have been been proposed. And kind of curious, you know, maybe what's what maybe holding up some of the, you know, more formal enrollment on some of those studies. Those maybe sound like they're coming sometime here over the next year as well. But maybe Bill, just bigger picture. Could you talk about how the company's view has evolved um, with TT fields and you know what makes you confident pairing TT fields with immunotherapies will further extend survival just broadly? This is not this is definitely a conversation that seems to have shifted here just in maybe the last 12 to 18 months with the company. Um, you know, do you think this the evolution towards increasing pipeline exposure to immunotherapies uh, shifts at all? Uh, is how we should be interpreting outcomes from your current late stage pipeline. Uh, it's kind of a two part question there. Yeah, so let me start with the first part and then move to the second part. The first part is our view from you know, 20 years ago uh, has remained consistent that uh, tumor treating fields is a, is a separate modality. Um, you know, so just as surgery, radiation, uh, uh, pharmacological therapies, and maybe you know, ph pharmacological can, can be split into chemotherapy and immunotherapy. I, I'm not trying to be pedantic, but, but we are an additional uh, modality. Uh, our modality has uh, a number of very interesting uh, characteristics or, or, or facts. First, um, we have essentially no toxicity. Uh, so no systemic toxicity other than, uh, you know, we do see some skin irritation under our arrays, which we're working to ameliorate. So because we don't have any toxicity, we can use our therapy for very long periods of time. Um, we also see that it can be combined with radiation and pharmacological therapy. So we've, and when we combine it with these other therapies, we never see an intensification of the side effects of either our therapy or their therapy. So the side effects of the, of, of our therapy remain, uh, you know, essentially non-toxic and we don't uh, intensify the toxicity of the other, uh, other therapies. When combining, we've never seen anything less than additivity, meaning one plus one equals two. So things are always better together. And in certain cases, we see synergy. This is the one plus one equals three. So we've been very uh, uh, interested in combinations with radiation, where we see synergy, combinations with certain chemotherapies, but principally the taxane, so abraxane, paclitaxel, uh, taxol, um, where uh, uh, the mechanisms are synergistic. But in those cases, you know, the taxanes are still toxic on their own. Um, but more recently, we see synergy uh, with the immunotherapies. And the exciting opportunity here is uh, for us, and again, I'll use the, you know, just the common way to talk about it, where we can um, uh, turn the tumors that are cold to immunotherapies uh, to make them make them hot. So, you know, again, Petruda uh, works wonderfully for patients who have a high um, uh, PD-1 expression, uh, but that's still the minority, for instance, of lung cancer patients. If we can combine tumor treating fields with Keytruda in these patients uh, for whom uh, the, the innate expression is, is not satisfactory, you can see how exciting that becomes. It also becomes exciting for us, and now I'll refer to our, our, our collaboration with Roche in pancreatic cancer. We are a regional therapy. So tumor treating fields, you know, we can treat the head, we can treat the chest, we can treat the abdomen. Uh, but, and in patients, what we've seen for patients who have metastatic disease, uh, we extend their life, but those are not patients that we would expect to, you know, you know, cure, uh, where if we get the intensity right, we can, we can cure GBM patients, we can cure patients where we treat the full extent of the disease. Now, combining with an immunotherapy and a tuned up immune system, um, we have the potential uh, to, to, to treat uh, systemic disease. And again, our um, PANOVA-3 trial in pancreatic cancer, we're treating locally advanced pancreatic cancer where we can treat the whole part of the peritoneum. But in our collaboration with, uh, with Roche Genentech, we're treating 
metastatic pancreatic cancer. We treat the primary tumor, but we also turn on the immune system for, uh, uh, for the uh, immune check, uh, checkpoint inhibitor uh, for the metastatic component. So there's a lot that's exciting there. Um, and that's why, as you said, it, it's not a new philosophy. I think it, it underlines, or a new strategy, but it underlines uh, our original strategy with a new advance in pharmacology. Very helpful, very helpful. Actually, I do want, I want to bring you in. Sorry for the a lot of the, the clinical focus questions so far in the trials, but numbers on, for the street have come, come in quite a bit for 2022. Uh, we're now comfortably below 600 million last time I checked for revenue. Um, you know, have, I guess from your perspective, have numbers come down enough um, or at, or does the recent spike in COVID cases over in Europe maybe warrant a, another reevaluation of prescriptions and revenue, uh, especially for a market like Germany? Yeah, no, great. Thanks for the question. And I don't mind following the clinical trial because I think that's certainly what we're most excited about internally. I think the message we want everybody to hear coming out of Q3, and this will remain as we look forward, is that we're now in a position where active patient growth is, the, is going to be the predictor of revenue growth. You know, after several years in which we were continuing to expand reimbursement, to get through administrative ramp-ups in Medicare, and to have a stable patient mix and newly diagnosed, we've now kind of hit all of those milestones successfully. And so it really comes down to a question of where do we think active patient growth is going to go. There's, there's too many unknowns for me to give you a fine-tooth point on that, but I, I think we can all look at those trends and make our own assessment. There, and that's certainly what we're doing internally. So I would say we're now in a position where, you know, estimates are, you know, far more reasonable, I would say, given where active patients are trending. And then I think I would continue to guide people to look at the active patient trends and then extrapolate that out to where they would anticipate revenue to grow. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. With geographical expansion um, on top of that, and of course, then, you know, our continued focus on penetrating the academic center. So we're not done accepting that, but I think that's, you know, those are longer term switches to both. You anticipated my question on France. I'll just leave that as, as is. I did have a couple other questions come in from the uh, from the investor group, um, specifically on Innovate 3, the interim analysis there. This is pro probably the, the, the last question we have time for here today. Um, so I guess first, well, do you have insight as to what, what the process is right now with the DMC? Have they met? Are there multiple meetings at play? Uh, what can be drawn from the length of time that's already played out since that last patient was enrolled? Because it has now been uh, a little over a month. Um, so that, again, th thanks so much for that one. Yeah, so uh, Innovate 3 is our phase three trial in um, ovarian cancer. And as, as I mentioned in the beginning, we, we did announce uh, last patient in about a month ago. That last patient in triggered the, uh, the, the point where the uh, DMC is charged with performing the uh, interim analysis. I fully expect that this interim analysis will be a non-event. Um, in the case of Lunar, where it was, turned out to be an event, Lunar, recall, was a trial that recruited over a long period of time. Thus, when the DMC met to do the interim analysis, they had a lot of events, even in a smaller uh, patient population. And so they were able to draw certain conclusions about the trajectory of the trial. Recall um, uh, this trial, um, the Innovate trial, was the opposite. It recruited very, very quickly. So when the DMC, uh, you know, they may be meeting